Okay, we're going to call this meeting <coughs> to order of the Costa Mesa Sanitary District, November 21st at 5.30 sharp. Please join me uh, in saluting the flag <coughs> of our country by placing your hand over your heart and saying, I pledge Much allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes, if you'd all bow your heads and draw, or listen to me, I guess. Uh, Heavenly Father, be with all those in attendance this evening and those not with us who need your guidance and comfort. As we enter the season of Thanksgiving, we appreciate all that has been done to make us appreciate the gifts we get. We hope that the gifts we give are meaningful and important. We ask that this season be a safe one and a happy one. Finally, as we remember the events that happened 50 years ago tomorrow, we hope that our country and the world remember the legacy created by John Kennedy, and that we strive to live by the ideals he gave us. Amen. 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 Roll call, please. Vice President Michael Schaefer. Here. Director Robert Uten. Here. Director Arlene Schaefer. Present. Director Arthur Perry. Here. And President James Fairman. Here. Thank you. Okay, the, the number five, five uh, ceremonial matters and presentations. Uh, we have right here before us a proclamation for uh, Jim Warner, who was on the uh, our board, obviously, for what well it says right here. 16 years. I, I, I won't read, the, read this because um, we're going to present it to him uh, at our Christmas party. Uh, I was at the Santa Ana River Flood Control meeting just prior to this meeting, and at that meeting, he received two um, awards, uh, one from the county supervisors and one from uh, Santa Ana River Flood Control. You know. So he was there and received them, and I said, we didn't forget about you, you know. So, uh, but uh, it is a, it is a, a nice, uh, we have to vote on this, incidentally. Uh, it's, it's very nice, we're gonna have it framed, and uh, I think uh, Jim will appreciate it very much. Marlene? I move that we accept the uh, proclamation and hand it out to Jim Warner. Second. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Okay, I'm going to put this back here so I don't bruise it. <laughs> uh, any late communications received? Uh, no, Mr. President. Uh, this is the portion of our agenda where we hear public comments. Is there anyone in the public? I, I don't have any uh, cards here, so anyone... Uh, the public like to address this board on any issue? Seeing none, we'll move along. Uh, consent calendar. Are there any items in the consent calendar other than uh, item 12 uh, that we're going to pull for discussion? Okay, I'd entertain a motion. Move the balance. Second. Uh, further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item 12. Yeah, I, I asked to have that pulled because I just wanted to get some clarification. Um, when I read it, I didn't know exactly where the location was that we're giving the assessment back to. And uh, Scott informed me that it was at the new center going up across from Mesa Verde Plaza, the old Coma Lanes area. Is that oh. correct? And uh, we, they didn't use any of our services. Because I looked at they've had bills from us for years. I mean, just but uh, 12 and 13, that's the first one that I saw that we assessed them, but they're, they are not in operation, is that correct? Correct, they're not correct for the system. And then I also noticed there was uh, MD Partners, and I just had a question, because the golf course is run by Mesa Verde Partners, I didn't know if that was the same one or not, so I was just curiosity more than anything. But I, I don't think it is. But yeah, I, I don't know, I just know the, the property's actually owned, owned by Cedarstone. Right. So that's the property, that's, that's who yeah, we're they, to. They may be leasing it, or <coughs> someone's leasing it from Cedarstone. Right. That was the only question I had. I don't know if Mike had a question. Yeah, just, I, I, was, <laughs> I assumed that they, they just kept paying their bill every year, right? Well, From it, when they applied? It's it's an assessment, you know. Uh, well, it, yeah. they didn't notice it until, right. okay. Um, I, had, I, was con I couldn't bring this up originally. I was able to finally 
see it. But, but, um, and I wondered, like Art, which property was. I had an idea that was it, just based on the number. Uh, and then the other question is this, that's a pretty sizable refund. Mm -hmm. Is there a limit on how much of a refund can stay on the consent calendar or before it comes to us for a special consideration or can any amount go on the consent calendar? It's, it's based on our um, criteria for how we assess our commercial based on property size. Um, um, it's based on a thousand square foot, so the, the larger the, the building, the, the, the higher the fee's going to be. No, no, I don't, I mean, is there a limit on... Three years, if, isn't it? If someone requests a refund, oh, no. is no. there, is there, there's no cap no. on the dollar that no. we can no. put it on, on the, the consent, consent calendar? Okay. No. Yeah. okay. I have one additional question. Are they going to be reassessed because of the size of the facility? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, when they're, when they're finally done, we'll, yeah, yeah. that's what I Because that's so. pretty awesome, pretty massive. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's getting bigger every day. Yeah. When you go mm -hmm. Wait, is this the, is this the old Corner Lane's yeah. assessment, or yeah. is this the, the new housing project? Right. Is the new yeah. property assessment, the senior property assessment? Yeah, I, I'm not sure what this assessment was for. I don't know. Okay, sure. um, <clears throat> the assessment was uh, placed on the property when they had come in for a permit to build for a, a multifamily housing, and so those unit figures were used um, in calculation of the assessment, which was why they were assessed in 1213. Um, they notified us that they had not begun construction. And so we went ahead and brought this forward to the board's attention. Okay. To refund, so. so it is the new, new, new building. Correct. There was only I, it, it, I was kind of once I read the number again, realized how far down it was because there's two major construction projects going on on Harbor right now. Although the one up, up mm -hmm. here is yeah. probably not Harbor; it's probably Bernard. Or Bernard. Yeah. You, you, mm -hmm. you know the one I'm talking about, Ron? Yes. Yeah. So I, but now everything's fine. I just was. Wasn't sure exactly. Okay, so we're good with that. I'd entertain a motion to move for approval. Second. Uh, discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Public hearings? We have none. Uh, General Manager Alternate, uh, District Engineer, Arizona Emissions Insurance. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as, as you know, we recently in implemented new procedures uh, with our district engineer and the alternate district engineer. Uh, when there's a, a conflict of interest, um, then the alternate district engineer will be reviewing and signing off on, on plans. Um, so there's a new procedure. So we have a signature block on plans for the alternate district engineer to sign off. Uh, if it comes to our attention that uh, our alternate district engineer, Bruce Mattern, does not have uh, errors and in emission insurance, which is um, standard for um, um, engineers and designers. Um, our district engineer has, currently has E&O insurance. Typically, it's, it's about $1 million uh, is the coverage, but because Mr. Manor doesn't do a whole lot of work for us, uh, I did talk to him to see if he'd be willing to go to 500000 or maybe $250,000, because then, again, he doesn't do a whole lot of work like, like our district engineer does. So, but he still, I guess he still did an analysis, financial analysis, and determined it's just too costly for him to even at $250,000 limit, it, it just wouldn't be in his, in, in his best interest to, to carry that insurance. So the board has a couple of decisions. Um, you, you, do, you can waive that requirement if you want to, uh, or um, uh, if, you, if you don't, then my suggestion is that we um, uh, uh, terminate the contract and, and then bring back to the um, uh, board uh, a recommendation for a different alternate, alternate district engineer because it's the board's authority to make that appointment. Um, I do want to mention that um, that when the agreement was approved with Mr. Mattern, that the district and Mr. Mattern did have some immunities for injuries uh, caused by uh, designs as long as, as it was reasonable. Um, but the immunity does not go as far as mistakes in plan checking. That's, that's one of the things he's doing is plan checking. Um, also, the immunity does not protect uh, Mr. Mattern if the district believes an accident at the job site was caused by his professional negligence. So um, if you do waive the um, e notions my opinion is that there are some potential liabilities for the insurance or for, 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 for <coughs> the district. Okay, what are the wishes? Uh, mm -hmm. Mike? Uh, I, I'll, I'll just tell you flat out if he doesn't have error, errors and emissions, I don't want it involved. I, I mean, I, I think there is a huge liability. I'm surprised you were able to find it. Or were you able to find carriers that would take 250 or 500? You know what? I, I've I, ne I've, I'm sorry, excuse me. I'm sorry, Scott. I've never seen it go below a million. <laughs> and, and I'm just, call it my bias or my profession, 
I just if, if he's not willing to get an E and O policy, I'm not I'm not in favor of waiving that requirement at all. Anybody? I agree. What would we have to do? I mean, what would you have to do as far as going after somebody? Well, we would um, obviously the big the big firms. Um, we also might have the insurance. Um, there are some firms out there that that can provide us um, the work. Again, it's it's not a lot of work, but at least they have the coverage. And so we can bring back a, a couple of, of, of firms with their with their rates, mm -hmm. and uh, make a and bring bring it back to you for your for decision. Rob, obviously you have you have it. Um, cost. My experience with the with the errors and emissions policies that I sell, <coughs> not that expensive. Uh, is is this you? Is this a category that is that expensive? I believe that, well, first of all, the the policy amount is based on your gross billings. Your premium. Right, your yeah. premium. So whatever goes through your books is determines your premium. And I believe that Mr. Mattern, uh, I, I find that the work he does, I don't think there's much risk involved, however. There are, I think it would be good to hear what SDRMA does and does not cover in terms of the work he does, so we understand what that risk is. And it's unfortunate that he would be considered not meeting our standard if he doesn't, doesn't have it. I know that for quite some time, I had an arrangement with the board where I did not have it, and that was one of the ways I could keep my rates very low, because SDRMA did have errors and omission that covered my services. I believe that Anna said in a staff meeting that SDRMA's coverage does not cover everything that Bruce would do. I think it's important to hear what it does and doesn't cover because if we do have it and you require him to have it, it would be a double coverage. And a lot of the plans he's checking are actually my sewer plans, which I, I certainly know what I'm doing. And however, not all of them are. Some of them are other engineers. So. I find it unfortunate that we can't navigate a way to keep him here, but I do understand that in today's world, the, uh, risk to him and to the district is somewhat unacceptable. But l to answer your question, my premium is in the seven to twelve thousand dollar range per year. So it, that's a pretty high. I'm your your category then is pretty high. I, I I do some contractors. <coughs> I don't do these kind of contractors, and the rates are generally in the twelve to thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars a year. Oh, okay, fourteen hundred. Fourteen hundred dollars a year. Really? Yeah, Alan really? and I and Mark will yeah. will be right behind you. <laughs> well, <laughs> we we don't base our premiums. Where do we on, sign up? We don't base our premiums on gross receipts. Okay. We're more of a more of a group type policy where they spread it out amongst. It. The whole block, so to speak. If, 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 I, I think Bruce mentioned. I think his was around three thousand dollars. He said his premiums were, and we did consult with SDRMA and uh, on the recommendation of the chief safety officer. He recommends he carries the you know, insurance. So based on SDRMA, they're recommending thirty. You know. I just thought yours would have been higher than mine. Mine's like fourteen thousand a year. Is it? Yeah. Wow. Okay. okay. Uh, Mark, would it be worth finding? I don't. I don't Connect so you to anything. Because you're on the board to find out more information. Not till January 1st. But I, 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 I mean, I'm, you probably talked to Dennis, and I'm sure Dennis Timoney, and I, that mm -hmm. would sound like something he would say. Um, we, ha as a district, we have errors and emissions, obviously, for 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 our work. Right? We have to question we have, we have, yes. If he's an independent contractor that we're hiring, our policy is not going to extend to him. I don't know if it's. I, I, I excuse me. I I believe back when I was under that, 
I, I believe it did. So, so you were, but you were more of an. I'm still not an employee. Yeah, and I'm, that's not the right word, but. No, you're you're pretty close on that. It was, and then we had a, you know, the attorney Filarski, he did some work for the board at one time, yeah. and he took a case all the way to the United States Supreme Court that determined that a uh, hired lawyer was entitled to the immunities and was a public official. And they went, they traced it back to the 1830s with the Postal Service and people that operated barges and things. And it was an amazing case. He was on the short end of a case down here for something <coughs> he authorized. And it went all the way up and he was determined, he established a law that he was, had an official type status and was entitled to some of the immunities. So that doesn't answer the insurance question, but it does, the immunities could apply to him. But like, Scott said, immunity doesn't cover everything he does. There's a design immunity that would work. And most recently, the uh, courts have extended the design immunity, and this is just in the last three days, to, to uh, not plan checking, but to as-built plans. And, but that, that doesn't cover everything. So I mean, all of, everything you've said, everything everybody said here is accurate and correct, and that's a, it's a policy decision you're making. I, I think what I like to say, I, I don't mind tabling it or continuing it, but um, I think we ought to have staff take a look at what's out there. If there's some other consultants we can look at that already have the coverage built in, I don't know if we can get bids from them or have them. Well, another question. There's still <coughs> two projects that are out there that he's supposed to be working on, so I need direction from the board. If you want to table this and I need direction from the board, then you're okay for him reviewing those plans, or are we going to tell the developers, hold on until we get the answer? I, I think you're going to have to keep him retained if Rob has a conflict or something else happens in the meantime we have to have somebody yeah. on board that's your official yeah. alternate district engineer sure. that can otherwise the business shuts down mm -hmm. and you don't have a person this is going to require a person being appointed so it doesn't matter <coughs> if it's Wildan or something we need a person not Wildan because mm -hmm. when you have an appointment it's a person mm -hmm. uh, not a company we, essentially we've been assuming this risk for quite a while now mm -hmm. um, it's a lower risk with somebody checking plans than it is, well, I would think it would be substantially lower cost and risk for somebody checking plans of some of somebody who's designing the plans. And yet the immunity is greater for the designer. They give greater protection for the designer. They mm. say, if he's your official engineer and it's a reasonable plan, you've got government immunity because people make mistakes and we're not yeah. going to hold government to a per perfection standard. Okay. It's just that his, his rate is, well, one, his rate is extremely low. If we go out on the market and find somebody, their rate's going to be more. You know, that's not really material it, because he doesn't put in many hours. Um, I'll make a motion, you know, that we, we uh, continue this and continue using Bruce Mattern um, in the foreseeable future until staff can come back with the information that you requested. I'll second it. And just for clear, what is the information you're requesting? I, I think what's what's on the market. I mean, let's talk to some other engineers yeah. that can do his job, that that have the you know, and see if we can get some idea of the cost. And mm -hmm. I think actually the board is going to want Scott to actually have a yeah. survey and all that information for you, and a person in mind that you could appoint before you relieve Bruce Mattern yeah. of his official title, because we need to. Yeah. Uh, I take him off. Yeah, yeah I, take I, him I, off I, the resolution. Put somebody else on at the same time. I need some numbers. It's very common that private civil engineers are used for plan check purposes, for both improvement plans prepared by civil engineers as well as building plans prepared by architects and structural engineers. So, it's there is, it's quite common. So, uh, Scott should not have trouble finding alternates to Bruce. Scott, do you, you, you have your direction? Yes. And so, I again want to tell you, so the, the two plans that are currently under review, you're okay with this, this matter review? Mm -hmm. uh, my motion was to retain him until you can, uh, until the board approves an alternative process. Clear. Okay. Oh, and Rob also talked with him, maybe he would consider purchasing it. In the, in he said he would. I know, but I'm just saying, I don't know. Well, yes, we can have additional discussions. Okay, yeah. it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 aye.
opposed? Okay, let's move along to uh, CR and our uh, Second Amendment. Scott? Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. I got a presentation. There you go. Thank you. Okay. So, um, thank you, Mr. President and Board of Directors. What I'll be presenting uh, to um, today is uh, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, really specifically, we're talking about the organic recycling program. I'm not going to go into too much details on, on all the, the criteria in the Second Amendment. It's, it's spelled out in the staff report. I will highlight some of the items in the Second Amendment, but I really want to focus on is the organic recycling program because that's the big change that that's, uh, we, we are recommending. So first off, what I want to talk about is here, these are the topics we'll be discussing today. Um, you know, why are we here? Um, can go over the full organic recycling program. Talk about the cost. As I mentioned earlier, we'll uh, talk about some of the highlights of the Second Amendment. And then we'll hear from CNR again, uh, give an update um, on their, um, what they call it, the Green Energy Facility or, or their anaerobic digestive facility in, in Paris. And then um, some recommendations. So, first I want to say, why are we here? And, and honestly, we've been discussing zero waste for the past three years. It all started in, in 2010 when we adopted the strategic plan. And the strategic goal at 2.5 was to encourage zero waste. Um, after adopting um, that plan, that goal, uh, we've had uh, nine meetings in 2011. And I've provided a list of those meetings on the screen. And um, all these meetings were public meetings. They were open to the public. They are all um, um, posted, uh, comply with uh, the Brown Act. Uh, we also started talking back in late 2011, AB 341, which is the, the law that's, that's, that's going to have a significant impact on all jurisdictions. Um, that's when we started, began having that discussion. And then in 2012, we had a couple of meetings, and um, uh, most notable, we had uh, meetings to talk about um, you know, how, what um, questions are we going to put on our survey to um, <coughs> deal with um, zero waste. And that's what we really did in, in 2012 was, was uh, went out and surveyed 1,000 of our residents. And the results of that survey, and these are some of the results, were you know, 80, over 81% over of those residents supported increasing the amount of trash diverting from the, from the landfill. Um, however, you know, 67% did like, they do like their single container. They do like mixed waste. Um, we have 40, almost 42% um, believe in protecting the environment as a reason for reducing the amount of trash. <laughs> and of course, um, we have over 43% that were opposing the um, reducing trash because fear of increased cost. 44% are, are willing to pay more for trash if the district can reduce the amount of trash going to the landfills, and then I also put there, there's 37% were unwilling to pay more, and 21% was unsure. Um, almost 73% said so they were willing to spend about one to five dollars more a month um, if if we can successfully reduce the amount of trash. So after getting the results of those um, survey, we've had four more meetings in 2013. Um, that's when we really started um, diving in the anaerobic digestive facility. Um, also, I want to mention that. There, there's been some comments out there that, you know, it's the first time the team's ever heard about this. Um, that's, again, I want to read it. We've had, you know, several meetings in the past three years. We did a press release on October 14th, about a year, uh, October 29th, special meeting. We sent that press release out to, to the press. Uh, we sent it out to all the government agencies, <coughs> our, our, um, our, our state representatives, blogs. So, you know, they received it, but no one picked up the stories. Um, obviously, I'm pleased to hear that we do, we do have representative David Pratt here today, and there was a story this week, and there was also a story in the Orange County Register. So that's so that's good. So the news is getting out there, but um, it hasn't not as not we never tried to attempt to get the word out and get the public to know about what we're trying to do. So it, this is nothing new. So what are the drivers? Why are we going this route to the organic recycling program? And I, I believe there's three primary reasons. One is, is our district mission, and that's protecting our community's health and the environment providing solid waste sewer collection services. Second is the goal that this board um, set in, uh, on April 10th was a goal of achieving 75% diversion by 2015, 90% by 2020. And then the significant reason was, is, is AB 341, which is the state mandate, which is requiring the state to divert 75% uh, by 2020. And so what they have to come back, this, the staff from, this, from Cal Recycle has to come back with some recommendations on how they're going to achieve that goal. And one of the most significant recommendations they're considering is repealing the green waste as alternative data cover at landfills. And they're also considering requiring organics to be source separated and prohibited from the landfills. But the one that's going to really have an impact on all the jurisdictions is repealing um, ADC. 
the crime fund, what that is, oh, first of all, what they want to do is, the state is trying to, they want to uh, reduce the smoke by 43 million tons. And by repealing green waste uh, as an alternative to cover, as in ADC, as you know, that's, that's green waste that, that is um, um, laid on top of the landfill as a, as a cover, as a covering. And um, if they repeal the ADC um, from the landfills, our diversion rate will go down from 57% to below 42%. Because now we cannot count, we cannot count green, the old ADC as diversion. Okay, so and not only that, then we believe what's going to happen. Everyone's going to be scrambling to try to find how we, because all everyone's diversion is going to go down. So how are we going to find to get a, get our diversion back up to meet the state mandates? And I believe there's not going to be enough composting facilities to, to, to handle that demand. And as a result, um, that will drive up the prices for for composting. So we believe. Uh, the staff believes and, and the board has, has agreed is that to, let's be proactive, not reactive. Let's let's be in the front line and, and when this when this hits, we'll be ready to go. Well, we are ready to go. We're ready to go and, and, and we won't be scrambling to find how we're gonna recover from our, our diversion. And so how our program will work is, is, is quite simple. <coughs> uh, every household will receive a 164 gallon or a 32 gallon organic cart, depending on the size of the cart they have. If they have a, Already, they already have a 32 gallon mixed waste cart, they'll get a 32 gallon organic cart. And there's the sample carts here in, in, in the lobby. So the standard service would be basically be two mixed waste carts where they can put in the recyclables, like their, their glass, their, their plastics, their paper, their cardboard, it could all go into their mixed waste container, their existing two waste containers. Then the third cart would be the one, the uh, organic cart. And so, um, if someone wants to, if a household wants an additional organic cart, they can have one at, at, at no cost. So residents could have two mixed waste carts and two organic carts at no cost. Now, if they get a third mixed waste cart or a third organic cart, then that eight dollar a month per can per can <coughs> charge would, would apply. And on the screen here, these these are the, um, uh, the materials that uh, can go in organic carts. All the, the, the food waste, the food scraps. Um, all the green waste includes lawn, grass, uh, tree branches, leaves, and of course it can also take uh, grease, kitchen grease, fog. Uh, right now our fog program says you can get it, you go to OCC, but this you can actually put your fog in, in the organic cart. So it's which would be uh, convenient during this time of the year. Now if households that do not generate um, any green waste, then there's a couple options for them. Uh, one, they can um, receive a 32 gallon food scrap cart at no additional cost or they can opt out and just keep their existing mixed waste carts. There might be uh, those households that generate neither food scraps or green waste, maybe it's just one person, maybe it's just a couple and they just don't generate a lot of food waste, green waste. Well, again, they can opt out of the recycling program, organic recycling program and keep both existing mixed waste carts. Uh, we also have, uh, for those residents who participate in the program, we have our kitchen pail and against the sample in the lobby, um, rather than after like a big dinner, you know, each, each, per, each resident, um, Remember, the household has to um, bring a plate back to the cart, scrape off the food instead of doing that. They could just all put it in, in, in the uh, kitchen pail and, and a one shot st shop stop, then they can dump it in, in the organic cart. So the organic, um, the, the organic cart will be placed on the curb uh, on regular trash day. Um, at right now we have nine, there's nine trucks in the fleet servicing um, um, our, our, our program. Only one additional car truck would be needed for this program. It won't be an additional nine trucks. It'll be just one additional truck for this program. That additional truck will be powered by compressed natural gas. Um, the organic truck will arrive at CNR from the camera. Station Stanton, and then uh, they would uh, dump it at the, s the station and then load it in the semi-truck trailers where it's transported up to their uh, Paris facility. Then the, the organics will be co converted into renewable clean gas, which will be powered by CNR's fleet. Any residue, res res residuals at the transfer station or the AD will be disposed at the landfills. And then the recyclables from the mixed waste containers will continue to be taken to their, their MRF, where they're separated, and then they're baled and um, taken to the markets, and then all the leftover trash will still go to the Owen Fresh Manor landfills. Now, um, CNR um, believes that we can, by doing this, we can get to our 75% diversion goal by 2015. Now, obviously, there is a change of behavior. Um, everyone's very used to putting everything in one container. However, I, I believe this, this behavior is very small and minor. Um, <coughs> consider recycling is in every day of our lives, right? We, we see tin cans, aluminum cans, 
We see plastic bottles. We, we have plastic milk cartons. We have paper. We have cardboard. It's every day of life. So mixing that with our waste is very convenient. However, we're not gardening every day. You know, in fact, residents are probably gardening once a week. Um, they're not mowing their lawns every day. Uh, you know, during the, the, the um, winter, it's probably twice, twice a month. Um, many residents have gardeners. So it's not a lot of effort to do really it one day a week to put your materials in a separate container. And then we also have kitchen pails, as I mentioned earlier, to help residents with their, um, with their, with their food scraps. Now, what are the options that are available for organic recycling? Sort of composting. And, but however, there's limited facilities in the, in the compost facilities here in Orange County, they're only permitted for green waste, for mulching and wood. They're not permitted to accept food waste. Um, in fact, many of the facilities, I believe, once, I if the state does repeal ADC, I believe many of the facilities will not be permitted to accommodate the demand of ADC. So people are going to be scrambling what to do with their, with their green waste. There's very few facilities in Southern California that, have, that accept food waste. And, and I found um, these, the, the green energy facility is the AD, that CNR facilities. In addition to that, I found three other facilities in Cal Recycles website. And as you see, the mileage to these facilities from from Stanton's, uh, from CNR's facility in Stanton is, is quite more significant than taking it to Paris. Um, also, I've, I've heard, well, <coughs> we have a composting, a very successful composting program here at the district where we give uh, composters to residents. And I've heard, well, now you're telling me I can't put my food waste in my compost, I gotta put it in a separate container. And the answer is no, that's not true. Um, you do, um, you can put food waste in your composter, but it has to be an even mix. You can't just put all your food waste, more majority of your food waste in there and limit it with other green waste. And furthermore, your composting, our composting bin that we, that we sell, you can't put meat, poultry, seafood, eggshells, or bones, or even fog into it. On this program we're proposing, those materials you can put in your organic carts. So next question, why do, we, why do organics have to be separated? Well, anamorphic digestive system, and, and CNR will, will go into more details about this, but basically the process is where micro, microorganisms break down organic material in the absence of oxygen. You cannot break down that organic material when it's mixed with trash, like styrofoam, plastic, grocery bags, clothing, pet waste. You know, it has to be clean for it to work, and that's why you've got to separate it. So next question, do I have to separate food scraps? And, and, and the short answer is no, you don't have to. And there's not going to be no penalty if, if we find food scraps in, in, in their mixed waste containers. Um, you know, if, if residents want to throw their food scraps in their mixed waste carts, by all means, they can do that. Uh, we just believe there, there are a lot of residents in the community that, that want to do their part to help reduce the amount of trash. And so this program is just another uh, pr um, program for them to be able to um, take their food scraps and, and separate it in the organic containers. It, it just gives them another option to help us reduce our, our trash. Let me talk about the community outreach. If, if the Second Amendment is approved and we implement the uh, organic recycling program, we will obviously do a very extensive community outreach out there because, like I said, this is a change in the behavior. So um, CNR will conduct at least three public outreach workshops, which is in the amendment. Um, we'll also describe um, in our newsletter at least twice a year. Uh, we'll put out flyers at our public facilities. Hopefully, maybe there's some TV coverage. Um, we also know Mesa Water Invoices inserts are very successful. It goes to all the households. Um, we got our boots. We also you know, have our, our trash container on display and talk about that. So there's, there's, I think it's a very comprehensive community outreach to get the word out there how, how the program will work. So let me talk about costs now. So as you know, we have two costs, two, two ways of, of, of our costs. One is the hauler rate. And um, right now, our, our haul rate will it'll, haul rate will go down to eight eight dollars and uh, almost ninety one cents per property owner and on an annual basis. That's about almost two point three million dollars. When the program is implemented, uh, that rate will go up by eighty nine cents to help pay for the carts, and that'll that will um, generate about two point five million dollars in revenue. So a difference of almost two hundred thirty thousand dollars, an additional two hundred thirty dollars thousand dollar cost. Then you have our CRT. Recycling disposal rate. Uh, we have uh, we're estimated this by the end of uh, 2013, we'll have about 41,125 tons. At the 51.97 dollar per ton rate, it'll generate about 2.1 million dollars, a cost of 2.1 million dollars in the cost. Now, we estimate that of that 41,125 tons, 67% of that would still go to the MRF as a mixed waste. 
and they'll still be applied at the 5197 charge. So that will cost about 1.4, a little over 1.4 million dollars. 33% of that is going to be organics, and that's going to go to the 80 facility in Paris. And that's going to be at a rate of $71.50, and that'll be 970344 dollars. $970,344. So here on the screen, if you take the $1.4 and the $970,000, which is the organic recycling program, comes out to $2.4 million. If you subtract out what our current program is, mixing away everything, it's a difference of $265,000. So when you add the hauler rate, the CRT recycling sold rate, our kitchen pails is about 1,000, you get 1,000 pails for $8,000. With our community outreach, that's two thousand dollars that would cost us for Mesa water to do our inserts. We're looking at almost five hundred five thousand dollars a year for this program. Okay. And what does that mean for our rates? Well, as I told, I mentioned before in the past, we, we do have a very healthy uh, fund balance. We have about four million dollars in our fund balance that we can help use to offset this additional cost. So there's a couple options you have. You know, we can keep the rate stabilized. We just lowered the rate to eighteen dollars, uh, eighteen dollars a month. We believe we can keep that rate stabilized for about five years using the um, uh, fund balance to help offset any um, additional costs like salaries or m and um, any other or, or any um, program for the um, organic recycling program. And then towards the end of the um, uh, 2020 and 2021, uh, the rate can go, would go up. I think it would go up significantly. I mean, I, I'm, you know, this is 2150. Again, I, I'm using a lot of assumptions. That rate could be lower. Um, it could be higher. I, I don't know, it's, but this is just some assumption what it can, can be. Another option is that maybe you just increase it small each year. You know, like here's an example. We just go, you know, we keep the rate stable for the next two years, and then we just, every two years, we have small increases. And then by the time at the end of uh, 2023, you know, it, it could go up to 2185. But again, um, there are, you know, just some assumptions I'm using. Um, we won't really know until every year, as we evaluate our rates every year, um, what we can do for the rates. But that's another option we, we can look at. It's just slowly increasing the rates is, is another option. So as far as the um, Second Amendment is concerned, there is no long-term commitment to the, pro uh, the, to the organic recycling program. In other words, we're not committed to a 20-year commitment. It's basically on the same term of our existing contract, which is a six-year evergreen. Um, the board is committed to go 10 years with the contract, and then, then we can consider if you want to consider on a year-to-year -year basis, or if you send a note, if you want to send a notice now for renewal, then it's the six years, another six years. But again, it's no, it's not a 20-year commitment. The conversion technology, basically the, the AD rate at 7150, is the lowest rate to any any other customers. That's a guaranteed lowest rate. And if they if CNR negotiates a lower rate with any other OC agency, then that rate should become our rate as well. Um, they are do their best effort to divert at least 75 percent of the waste stream. The implementation is up to the board. Um, they're ready to go in the fall of 2014, but if you want to go in 2015, they're willing to do that, so we can start in 2015. Uh, another thing I want to mention on, on the amendments is that the, dist the district net hauler rate, um, again, that excludes our salaries, um, any kind of uh, as always programs, any other fees, just the net cost. The net rate it must be within 10% of the average net rate of all the 30 OC agencies in Orange County. If it's higher than 10%, then CNR is, has to rebate the, the, just the amount necessary to achieve that 10% threshold. And that does not include the AD costs because it's, then you're not really comparing apples to apples. So if, if CNR was able, if CIRA is able to get another some more agencies on board with the program, with the organic recycling program, then that survey will be included, and then that threshold will, 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 will apply. But I just want to make that clear that this this average net to haul rate does not include the AD cost. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to um, Mike Silva. Or do you want to answer questions? Yeah, yeah, I just have one question. Sure. And that was you talked about two trucks. Yes. Now was that the same day of your trash? Yes. In other words, one same would day. follow the other, or well, not right behind, but it would come yeah. that same day, correct? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be two trucks, yes. Okay. So, Scott, did you say a 10-year term? Did it be a 10-year term? Well, no, it's it's a six-year term right now, but the board has, has agreed to at least go to 10 years on this because after four years, the, the fourth year, the six-year evergreen kicks in. So, so you so believe the board would approve a 10-year term? No, 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 no. It's currently right now 
You mean the, the previous contract? The current contract right now, the board is committed to 10 years. But we're, right now it's a six year evergreen. Right, six year so evergreen. We're into the six year period, not the 10 years. No, no, I think I'm confused. Current contract is a four year term, right? After the four year term, the six year evergreen will kick in, right? Mm -hmm. Six year evergreen. So the board did not decide not to issue its notice, it's, it's renewal notice. So that's six years again. So we're in it for 10 years. That's what I'm saying. The board's committed for 10 years. I, I'm, I don't think that's correct. We're going to have to talk more about that. Okay. So, um, anyway, so the six year evergreen is in the Second Amendment. Um, it's uh, um, up to the board if they want, you know, the board is it's on a yearly basis. If we want to renew it, um, it's just on it every year. If we send a notice, then that six year evergreen will kick in. So, um, if there are any more questions, what I'd like to do is turn it over to CRNR to talk about the update on their um, facilities, and then I just have a, the recommendations and we'll answer some questions. So, if there are any more questions, I'll turn it over to CRNR. Anybody have a question? Okay, can you, they have a presentation, so let me. Um, Mr. President, uh, good evening. My name is Dean Ruffridge, as you know, and Mike Silva is here. He's our manager of the 80 project, and Lawrence Jones is here also. Uh, we're excited about tonight, and we're looking forward to some kind of action from the board tonight, um, if, if not a full action, at least a conditional action, so that we have some kind of assurances going forward. We're under construction. Mike will go over that with you in a little bit. It's a 25 to $30 million expenditure. Um, a couple things that I think I picked up when when, um, when Scott was talking. We are, I, I believe, um, we are into the six-year evergreen part of the contract, Scott, and and, you know, originally, I think years ago when I was here, we, we wanted a long-term commitment from the board because of the expenditure, and that's gone away. We've got a lot of uh, interest in the project. Costa Mesa's, we've been working with you on this or a similar project for about 10 years. Uh, like Scott said, the last three years have been pretty heavy at a lot of meetings, a lot of public workshops, uh, a lot of looking at different alternatives. We're, we're hoping for, to go to move forward on this. Um, as far as the two pass versus the one pass that Eileen brought up, um, you know, we've had the single pass in Costa Mesa, I believe, for 22 years, and it's worked really well. We've got a great diversion. It's, it's time for a little change. It's time to move on to that 75% goal. And the only way to get there as far as we're concerned in a residential-only waste stream is to go to some kind of organics program. Um, so we're looking forward to it, and with that, I'll uh, I'll let Mike talk about the project and where we're at. And you've seen most of these slides, but just to give you a little refresher. Yeah, I'll just skip to the pictures because Scott did a great job on the overview. So go ahead, Scott. Keep, keep, keep sliding through here until we get to the pictures. I won't bore you with all these details. Go right past that Stanford University picture. Yeah, just move by that fast. <laughs> when Jim's, you know. Stanford? Did I hear Stanford? I don't want his blood pressure to go up again. <laughs> Right there, that's good. So where we're at today, permitted wise, excuse me, I'm under the weather a little bit. We've got all our permits except for the physical construction permits from the city of Paris. We've been through plan review at least twice with them. So now we're literally down to the structural, you know, the concrete and stuff like that. And just by coincidence, I was talking to Rob earlier. I think a couple of three of you are on the sand board. Um, our contractor's doing a huge uh, improvement in Fountain Valley, the WM Lyles. They're doing the upgrade for the Fountain Valley sewer plant. That's our contractor also. And they're exclusive with us on this AD um, project. So they're going to build this project. And we're looking at a couple others uh, down the road. But I'll just give you AD 101 real quick. Um, how ours differs from others is that this is a big concrete vessel, very similar to a sewer plant. And we can take liquids and solids in there. And ours is dynamic. In other words, it's always mixing. It's not a static. <coughs> the bugs in there basically um, excrete methane when they're done eating the stuff. We capture the methane in this tank and it goes into the gas upgrading system. <coughs> Excuse me. The neat thing about our gas upgrading system is that it's water-based. There's no chemicals, there's no membranes in there. And the guy that sells that to us is a company called Greenlane. He corrected me last time, so I'm going to use his spiel. Basically what we do is we pressurize the CO2 in the methane. The CO2 is soluble, so it goes into the water. The methane goes up. The methane that goes up, we capture and put into our trucks. It becomes natural gas. I used to say to get the CO2 back out, we pop the can of Pepsi. He's from France, so he says it's like popping up a bottle of champagne. He upgraded his system, he said. So, 
So you, you pop the bottle of champagne, and the CO2 comes out, and the water goes right back through the system. So it's very slick how they did that. It's just based on pressure. The two streams that come out the bottom are a liquid soil amendment and a solid soil amendment, and those both go to farmers out in the Riverside area where we are. Uh, we have a lot of we have a, we have a thick sod farm out there ourselves. We have a 200 acre sod farm right now um, that we subcontract with. So it'll go to sod, alfalfa, probably to start those two crops are the biggest crops out in where we are. Let's go to the next picture. And again, uh, shout if you have any questions. Um, Ad living this because Scott did a great job. He covered everything we've been talking about. So this is a good artist rendering of it. <coughs> it actually looks like two digesters, but it's four. Each one of these is a duplex. And it's just a, an artist rendering of what we just saw. Go to the next one. Now this is actual to scale. This is what we gave to the city of Paris. These are called massing diagrams now that we have to provide to the city to make sure you're not dominating the the, the, the people around you and causing other issues. So this is actually a Google's map of our site. So we have 52 acres out there. When we're all done, this will be our phase one. We're set up for three more phases, as you'll see. And we're talking to the cities of, uh, obviously you guys are number one. Uh, the city of Newport Beach has an addendum in their contract that we just received last week that allows them to go to this facility if they decide to do that. Um, we're on the short list for the city of LA. We're the only digester company left standing. There's three of us. Well, hopefully they're going to go with us. Um, and we're talking to obviously our two host cities where we do most of our business as far as headquarters go, which is the city of Stanton and the city of Paris, which is the host facility for this. And then the first, the first, and this is kind of similar to you guys, but on the other end of the spectrum, you guys have been the first one pass city. The first three can city we ever had was the city of Temecula. And they're talking about converting to the two can system. So you guys are going one way to two cans, and they're coming back to two cans. So we think that's going to be the cat's meow of the two can system. Two streams. Number of cans is not really relevant, but the two streams seems to be where everybody's heading. The next one, please. <coughs> so that's what we. That's our dream deal. Is when we have all four phases done. Um, we'll probably be in the dirt. Oh, hopefully within three weeks. We already have our grading permit. But we got some stuff we've got to get out of the way before we get started out there. And as always, you're always welcome to holler at myself or Dean. We'll take you out there and take a look around. Not much to see today. 52 acres of uh, a lot of stuff. It's a big truck yard out there. And so that would be all four phases. So our whole goal is to fill phase one with you know, Costa Mesa, Newport, Stanton, Paris, people like that. And then the city of L.A. is actually equivalent to all those cities put together. They could buy phase two just by themselves. Put in perspective of how we've been courting you guys all these years, you know, uh, over 20 years. The city of LA, um, their deal is 72.50 a ton. They have to give us 210 tons a day, and they have to sign a 15-year contract. So that's what the city of LA is compared to where what we've offered you guys. Um, and yours is about 50 tons a day, ballparkish, and they they have to buy the whole digester for us to do a contract with them. We would have to build an entire facility just to handle them. Go ahead, Scott. <coughs> Go ahead and change through these because we're very familiar with these ones here. I'll wait for the next graphics. Yeah, when this one gets all teed up, go ahead and stop, Scott. Okay. So this has also been calculated into your rates. I think uh, Jim or Art asked about this last time, our net credits. So we've been very fortunate. I was up there two Fridays ago with the CEC. They issue um, a grant program about once a year for about $25 million. It's kind of a beauty contest. Everybody puts in for it. And we won, obviously, last year. So we got a $4.5 million grant from them, from the AQMD. That's actually made up of three different grants because we're going to do our own fueling because we're going to renewable natural gas and because we have our own trucks. So it's made up of three different grants to make that 500000 So that's all obviously been netted out of your guys' rates also. These are two big federal um, subsidies. Basically, by making renewable energy, we get a what they call a RIN credit. And in a nutshell, what happens is the real big oil guys have to use so much renewable energy, so they pay a tax 
that comes back to the smaller guys like us that are actually making renewable energy. And then we pass that through to our rate payers. Okay, Scott. Okay, this is a good example because this is actually was based on your city originally. Um, we did an analysis. We had eight trucks <coughs> running on our current. This is before we even went to C and G. We were running on diesel. This was our metric tons a year, 850 tons. Once we convert the whole fleet over to a renewable natural gas, we'll actually be a negative number. We'll actually cut the greenhouse gas emissions by 101% because we're making the fuel from an organic waste. So there's no uh, transmission costs, no uh, delivery costs, none of that. Okay. And this is where that comes from. This is actually from the um, California Air Resources Board. And they rank each fuel, excuse me, based on how much carbon is emitted per energy unit. So you can see ours is actually a negative 15. We're actually carbon negative because, again, our delivery. And this is what they call well to wheels, the whole thing. You know. um, c and G is clean, but most c and is coming from Texas and back east, so there's some cost to get it here environmentally. Um, landfill gas obviously made locally, but it's not as clean as ours because landfill gas isn't as efficient as ours because we capture 100% of all the emissions. Landfills capture about 75% of the emissions. All right. Coup de gras here. Okay, so <clears throat> basically, organics now you have three options with them. They continue going to the landfill. As you know, they passed the methane laws a few years ago, where now you've got to recover as much methane as they can. And so, probably their best guess, this is per EPA, is they're capturing 75% of the methane for energy and emissions, but obviously, 0% of the nutrition because the grass and the Organics, eggshells are all still in the dump. They're not used to grow something else. So the next level up, environmentally, people like to go to composting. So you capture all of the nutritional value, and that's the stuff you find on the rack at Home Depot and Lowe's and all that stuff. But obviously, you're capturing none of the emissions and none of the energy because they're just doing it in the open air. So that's where our system comes in, the anaerobic digestion system. So we get 100% of the energy, 100% of the emissions, at 100% of the nutrition. Obviously, the difference is, we talked about this last time, in round numbers, this is a $25 solution, this is a $50 solution, and this is a $75 solution. And so, obviously, being cutting edge, just like when we went to the one can system, we had the same discussion 20 years ago, is that it costs a little more to do the right thing. And, you know, this here is do nothing. This here is a big farming operation. And this is a $25 million CapEx. So that's really where we're going to. And I, I believe everybody's going to be in this. In fact, we're going to an open house tomorrow up in San Jose. And it's the only other person that's building a facility like this. It's, a, it's completely different technology, but the same process. In other words, it's anaerobic digestion. There's is dry fermentation. But they've spent $45 million on their plant. And they're opening up tomorrow. And the city of San Jose is their sole supplier. So we definitely think you know, they've got a good plan. <laughs> We've got a good plan. Oh, you know what's about San Jose? I'm, I'm going to be up there, too. Oh, you going tomorrow? Up the opening? Play Navy. No. <laughs> oh, 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 this we reason. Got, we've got a different purpose for going. Different on. reason. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so anyways, um, yeah. so that will be two major plans yeah, in, in California. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. You guys have questions? That's where we're at today. Yes, ma'am. I had one. So we'd be in the first phase? Yes, ma'am. And when would that be completed? We're hoping for October 2014 to be done. And it'll take us about 90 days to ramp up because you got to um, inoculate it, you got to fill it up, and you got to get the right bugs generated in there. So that's why Dean said to Scott that 